The Zach Files How I Went From Bad to Verse By Dan Greenberg, illustrated by Jack E. Davis Chapter 1 How much control do you have over your mouth? I mean, does your mouth pretty much say what you want it to? Or does it blabber out whatever it wants to? I used to have pretty good control over my mouth till this one time I'm going to tell you about. But first, I guess I should tell you who I am and stuff. My name is Zach. I'm ten and a half, and I'm in the fifth grade at the Horace Hyde White School for Boys. That's in New York City. My folks are divorced, and I spend half my time with each of them. In my English class we're writing poetry now. We're studying a poem by a guy named Joyce Kilmer. I don't know too many guys named Joyce, but my English teacher, Mr. Hoffman, swears Joyce Kilmer was a guy. Anyway, this guy wrote a poem about a tree. It starts. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. What's the point of comparing poems to trees? I asked Mr. Hoffman. I don't get it. Trees are going to win, hands down. I mean, can you climb a poem? Can you get fruit off a poem? Can you stand under the shade of a poem on a hot summer day? You can't. I mean, I just don't get the point. It's clear Zach has some very strong feelings about trees, said Mr. Hoffman to the class. Zach, I think you should write a poem about a tree. In fact, I think everyone in the class should. And to inspire us, let's go to Central Park and really study trees. Everybody liked that idea, so off we went to Central Park. We lay down in the grass. Mr. Hoffman passed around a bag of Fritos. We stared up at the trees and tried to make up poems about them. It was a lot harder than I thought it would be. In fact, it was impossible. I can't do it, I said to Mr. Hoffman. I can't even come up with a single rhyme. Zach, you haven't been here five minutes, said Mr. Hoffman. Give it time. Okay. I said, but I knew he was wrong. Then something bit me on the butt. A mosquito or something. I smacked it. After a while, it started to itch. I began scratching it pretty hard. Mr. Hoffman saw me and frowned. Zach, what are you doing? he asked. I was about to answer him when suddenly everything got kind of blurred. Sir, a bug just bit my butt, I said. I'd prefer you didn't use the word but in my class, said Mr. Hoffman. Then things got even more blurred. And words I hadn't meant to say started walking out of my mouth. I said. What would you rather hear a word like rump or rear? Either of those would be better, said Mr. Hoffman. I didn't mean to answer, but I did. Perhaps you wouldn't mind if I called it a behind. Or, depending on their use, a poop deck or caboose. Zack, said Mr. Hoffman, smiling. You're rhyming. See? I knew you could do it. I wanted to tell him I wasn't doing it deliberately, that I couldn't do anything but rhyme now. Instead, I said. My father's Uncle Manny calls a butt a fanny. My Aunt Sophie, who is tiny, calls my butt a hiney. Grandma Leah, who is pushy, calls my butt a tushy. Uh, very good, Zach, said Mr. Hoffman. A couple of the guys nearby started giggling. Mr. Hoffman's smile had kind of frozen on his face. I didn't want to say anything else. But I started blabbering again. Our baker, who likes puns, sometimes calls it buns. I also know some geeks who call their butts their cheeks. Mr. Hoffman's face had gotten cloudy. That is enough rhyming now, he said. I certainly didn't want to talk in rhyme after that, but I just couldn't help it. I said. 
In England, though it's dumb, they call a butt a bum. In France, where folks are merrier, they call a butt a derriere. And last spring, I think on Easter, I heard someone call it cooister. But call it can or bottom, it is clear that we've all got M. The guys were laughing. Mr. Hoffman looked really mad. Zack, he said, if you don't stop rhyming, I shall send you home. I squeezed my jaws together so I couldn't blabber any more rhymes, but it was no use. I said. I meant no disrespect. It's not what you'd expect. I swear to you that I'm really trying not to rhyme. Mr. Hoffman phoned my dad. Chapter 2 By the time Dad came to the park to get me, I was really dizzy. Also, I was beginning to sweat like it was the middle of August. Which it wasn't. Dad felt my forehead. Zack, you're burning up, he said. I think you have a fever. I was feeling so weak by then, I couldn't even speak. Dad helped me into a cab, and we went directly to Dr. Kropotkin's office. Well, 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 said Dr. Kropotkin. Zack and his dad. It's always interesting when you come. How is your little friend from outer space with the two hearts? Fine, said Dad. So what's the matter now? asked Dr. Kropotkin. Is Zack turning into a cat again? No, said Dad. Since I can still see him, he must not be turning invisible again, said the doctor. So what's the problem? My teacher sent me home because I made a poem, I said weakly. Because you made a poem, said Dr. Kropotkin. Making poems is an art. I can't understand why you were punished for making a poem. I wouldn't have if I'd stopped I rhymed until I dropped, I said. Ah, said Dr. Kropotkin. Well, that's different, if you couldn't stop. That's a different kettle of fish entirely. Have you ever heard of a condition like this before? asked my dad. Dr. Kropotkin didn't answer. Instead, he put his stethoscope in his ears and listened to my chest. Then he had me get undressed. When he saw my butt, he frowned. Hmm, he said. Tell me, Zack. Have you by any chance been bitten by a tick? I thought it was mosquitoes, I got bit while eating Fritos, I said. The doctor nodded his head. Then that explains it, he said. What do you think he has? asked my dad. Rhyme disease, said Dr. Kropotkin. Rhyme disease, repeated my dad. You mean it's like a sneeze? My rhyming's a disease? I asked. The doctor nodded. Is it serious? Dad asked worriedly. No, not if we catch it early, said the doctor. I want Zack to go straight to bed. He should stay warm and drink lots of fluids. And by all means, avoid anything that rhymes greeting cards, songs, especially rap music anything of that sort. If he isn't feeling any better by tomorrow, I want you to bring him back here. We went home in a cab. As soon as we got inside the apartment, Dad gave me dinner and then put me right to bed. The next morning, as I started waking up, even before I opened my eyes, I knew something was terribly wrong. I couldn't feel the bed underneath me. And something was pressing lightly against my head. Slowly, I opened my eyes. Oh no! I was floating about eight feet above my bed, bobbing right up against the ceiling. Chapter 3 My head was touching the light fixture in the middle of the ceiling. Dad, Dad! It's really bad. I yelled. Dad came running into my room. Zack, he said. What are you doing on the ceiling? I said. I dreamed I was eating baked cod. 
I awoke with a feeling quite odd. I opened my peepers and said jumpin' jeepers. There's no bed under my bod. I can see that, said Dad. But are you all right, Zack? How are you feeling? You're asking me how am I feeling? What I'm feeling is not so appealing. I feel like a goon, or a helium balloon, just bobbing my head on the ceiling. Okay, Zack, said Dad. I'm going to get you down, son. Don't worry. Dad reached way up, grabbed me by the foot, and pulled. I floated down to the bed. Then I bounced off the mattress and float Ed back up to the ceiling. Okay, said Dad. I think I know what we have to do. Once I have you down on the bed, Ely tie you in place. You're going to tie me up? I'm not a little pup, I said. No, no, I know you're not a pup, said Dad. But once I get you down I have to keep you in one place. Dad raced out of the bedroom. Then I heard him in the kitchen, banging cupboard doors open and closed. A minute later Dad came back. He was carrying rope, a dust cloth, and a light bulb. As long as you're up there, he said. Could you dust the top shelves and change that burned-out bulb? I groaned loudly. Okay, okay, said Dad. Maybe that's not such a good idea. Let's get you down now. Dad pulled me gently down to the bed again. He tied my ankles to the bedposts. There we go, said Dad. But whatever was pulling me upwards was awfully strong. I slid out of the rope and floated up to the ceiling. Okay, that wasn't such a good idea either, said Dad. Let's go back to the doctor. He pulled me down and helped me change into my clothes. I held on to the bedposts to keep from floating upwards again. When I was dressed, Dad made a little harness out of the rope and put it around my chest. He attached one end of the rope to the harness. The other end he held. Then, we carefully made our way outside. We must have been a strange sight, a man walking with a floating boy on a leash. People on the street tried not to stare. But a little kid we passed thought we were the most interesting thing he'd ever seen. Mommy, why does that man have a floating boy? he asked. I don't know, dear, she said. It must have something to do with the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Chapter 4 So, Zack, said Dr. Kropikin. How are you feeling today, better or worse? The doctor chuckled. Dr. Kropotkin, said Dad, Zack's condition is not a joke. I know. I'm sorry, said the doctor. But sometimes humor helps. Not this time, said Dad. Zack's not only rhyming now, he can't even stay on the ground. I could say I always thought Zack had both feet on the ground. Or I could tell him to stand on his own two feet, but I won't, said the doctor. Good, said Dad. Instead of making bad jokes, can you tell us why this is happening? The doctor scratched his head. Frankly, he said, we don't get too many cases like this one. But if I had to take a guess, I'd say it was all this light verse that Zack's been spouting. The light verse is making him lighter. If we can get him to stop rhyming, I think we can stop him from floating. And how do you suggest we get him to stop rhyming? Dad asked. One thing we could try is having him say words that can't be rhymed. Like orange. That might short-circuit whatever it is that's making him rhyme. Okay, said Dad, Zack, just say the word orange and see what happens. I nodded. I tried to say orange, but nothing happened. I tried again. No sound at all came out of my mouth. I shook my head. Maybe it worked, said the doctor. 
Maybe he's cured. Zach, are you cured? Dad asked. You ask if I've become. A guy who speaks in prose, instead of one who babbles verse till it's coming out his nose. I hate to disappoint you on so serious a matter, but, unhappily, I must admit I'm not the former but the latter. Dr. Kropotkin sighed. All right, he said, so it didn't work. By the time we got outside it had become very windy. It was all Dad could do to hang on to the end of my leash. I sailed about eight feet in the air. I felt like a kite. The wind blew me all over the place. It was a weird feeling. Then, as we were crossing Madison Avenue, a really strong gust took hold of me. It tore the leash out of Dad's hands and lifted me high in the air. The wind blasted me to the top of a huge maple tree. I hung onto the branches for dear life. I was so high, I was scared to look down. I must have been thirty feet up. Zach, are you all right? Dad shouted. How could I possibly be all right? I am practically dying of fright. I yelled back. Well, I'm going for help. Dad shouted. Hang in there. I peered down. I was as high up as a three-story building. Much too scary to climb down. I watched Dad run to the end of the block to a fire alarm call box. I saw him yank open its little door and pull the lever. In a few minutes, fire engines would come. A big black bird hopped up to me on a nearby branch. It cocked its head as if to say, What the heck are you doing in my tree? I thought it wanted to be friends. But then it tried to peck at my eyes. I pulled away from it so fast, I almost lost my grip on the tree. The wind was whining through the branches. The tree was swaying back and forth. You don't realize how far a tree bends in the wind unless you happen to be on top of it. Or unless you're a bird. Plus it was cold. I shivered as I waited for the fire trucks. How are you doing, Zach? Dad shouted up to me. I was about to answer when I heard the sirens. Then a fire engine, a chief's car, and a hook and ladder truck came tearing around the corner. Firemen in shiny black fire coats and helmets hopped off their rigs and began hooking hoses up to a red fire plug. Where's the fire? I heard the fire chief ask Dad. Oh, there's no fire, I heard Dad explain. I called you because Zack is stuck up in the top of that big maple tree there, and he can't get down. Cat up a tree, yelled the chief. Crank up the tower ladder. Zack's not a cat, said Dad. Zack is a boy. Usually it's the cats that can't climb down, said the chief. Well, Zack's not a cat. Dad answered. Although it's true he still hides under the coffee table when I vacuum. Excuse me, said the fire chief. Oh, that's just a holdover from the time he got scratched by a cat in the Temple of Dender. Dad explained. He did start turning into a cat grew whiskers, started hissing at dogs, that type of thing. But it never went all the way. He's all over that now, in any case. Uh-huh. You sure this one's a boy? asked the chief suspiciously. Pretty sure, said Dad. The chief gave Dad a long look, then got his men to crank up the tower ladder. The ladder slowly rose to meet me, like a drawbridge over a river when a boat wants to get through. The ladder reached clear to the top of the tree. As soon as it got into position, a big fireman started climbing up it. Hang on there, kid, he called. I'm coming to get you. The fireman was as big as an NFL linebacker. He grabbed me in one huge arm and lifted me onto the ladder. You're safe now, kid, he said. Hey, what the heck were you doing up here at the top of a thirty-foot tree? 
hadn't planned on being here, it was a huge surprise. But I'm glad you rescued me before. That bird pecked out my eyes. The fireman looked at me suspiciously. Why are you talking in rhyme? he asked. Is this some kind of a joke? Hey, wait a minute, was this a crank call? I shook my head. Oh gosh, no holy smoke. I swear it's not a joke. I'm really, really grateful, and I know this rhyming's hateful.